Okay. All right. So you can hear me okay, everybody? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this presentation in the Temple Sinai series, Democracy Under Threat, The Way Forward. I am Marilyn Rosen, a member of the Temple Sinai Social Action Committee, Democracy Under Threat Working Group. The other wonderful members are Joan Rubin, who you'll be hearing from soon again, Joyce Herman, and Sandy Mitzner, who are all here. Uh, Sandy discovered the book our speaker co-wrote through an article in the Washington Post. So special thanks to her. We built our whole theme around this book. Our committee's fearless leaders are Susan Stanger, Leslie Newman, and Donna Goldberg, all of whom are here supporting us, and the presidents of our temple, um, Renee and uh, Jamie Spiller. Um, I'm supposed to be doing the housekeeping uh, items. So usually, you know, you tell people where the restroom is, but alas, we are still on Zoom. So I would just ask you to keep your mics on mute during the presentation, and Joan will talk about the Q&A. This weekend, we Jews will be celebrating Shavuot, the festival recounting the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. As our Rabbi Till said in her monthly column, quote, at Shavuot, we are taught to say, I was free at the foot of Sinai, reminding us of the tremendous value of the gift of freedom and the responsibility to use it wisely, unquote. Tonight, we shall be exploring how to hang on to that freedom with our speaker, Robert Lieberman. And so I give you Joan Rubin, who will be introducing him. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. And thanks also to Sandy Mitzner for uh, suggesting that Robert's book uh, become the framework for this series. And, and at the end, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the um, plans that we have for the series in the future. But right now we're gonna focus on this evening and our guest, Professor Robert Lieberman. I'm going to introduce him uh, mostly with um, um, material that I plagiarized from his website. This is <laughs> not something that I recommend to my students, but I'm going to do it here. Uh, so here goes. He, he is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University. He earned a BA summa cum laude from Yale and a PhD in political science from Harvard. Professor Lieberman taught at Columbia University before moving to Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University in 2013, where he became provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, a position he held until 2016. Robert Lieberman studies American political development, race, and American politics, race and American politics together, and public policy. He has also written extensively about the development of American democracy and the links between American and comparative politics. And if you go on his um, webpage, you will see that his biography is replete with honors, including multiple prestigious prizes for his books, uh, a book uh, called Shifting the Color Line, Race and the American Welfare State, for one, and another, Shaping Race Policy, the United States in Comparative Perspective. The book, Four Threats, which I have here, it's a prop, uh, Four Threats with the subtitle, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy, was co-authored with Suzanne Mettler at Cornell University, and it came out in 2020. That work, of course, frames our discussion for this evening, but, uh, but so I imagine does the title of his forthcoming work, also co-authored with Suzanne Mettler, as well as Kenneth M. Roberts, the title of that work is Democratic Resilience, can the United States withstand rising polarization? And that is certainly a question that is on the minds of all of us. So um, I will turn things over to our distinguished guests in a moment. But first, let me say a little bit about how we're going to run the Q&A after his talk. I wanted uh, to try to do this a little bit differently tonight 
from the way that we, we have done it in this group in the past. And we are small enough, I think, that this can work. So instead of typing your questions or comments in the chat, you will, let me say you can do that if you feel shy or reticent. But um, what would be better would be to use the raise hand function that Zoom uh, gives us. Uh, it's, um, it's under uh, reactions down at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you don't know how to do that, you can, of course, uh, revert to the chat or you can just wave and I'll see your hand. But the advantage of raise hand is that you line up then in the order of your question um, and you can speak your question. And we can also discuss among ourselves your comments and questions. I'm hoping that uh, given the size of this group, we'll be able to talk about some of the points that Professor Lieberman raises with us tonight. The other thing I'll say, and I'll say it again when he's uh, uh, finished with his presentation is that turning on your video makes a huge difference in terms of letting us connect with one another. Um, you can eat, you can be in your PJs, you can pet the dog, you don't have to be uh, uh, presentable, but it would be good if we can see you. And I'll say that again at the end uh, when it will be even more important as we get into some Q&A. But right now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Lieberman. Well, thank you so much, Joan. It's a real pleasure to be uh, here and uh, uh, to help you um, think through some of these issues that I know you're thinking about a lot. I'm trying to share my screen because I have some slides. Let's see, Good. there we go. Okay. There we go. Can people see that? Yeah, great. Okay. So, um, uh, I'm, as, as Joan said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the themes um, in the book that Suzanne Mettler and I published uh, now a couple of years ago called Four Threats, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy. Um, but we begin with some familiar, um, more recent images. On January 6th last year, we all, excuse me, watched in horror as hundreds of supporters of the then president, the, the guy who the current president calls the former guy, um, stormed the US Capitol, trying to interfere with the final step in certifying the results of the 2020 presidential election. Um, you know, they and they brought in, of course, as we all saw, Confederate flags and Nazi symbols and, um, and the sort of symbolism of white supremacy and tried to, or, or, or at least seem to be trying to overturn the will of American voters with brute force. Six people died as a result of confrontations on that day. Police officers were badly wounded. Um, it could have been much worse, but it was bad enough. Most shocking of all, I think, is that the insurrection was incited by the president of the United States himself, who had spent the previous months and even years um, sowing doubt about this sort of basic function of American democracy. Um, and then had spent the immediate time after the election and, and ever since then, frankly, denying his loss in the election, um, despite all evidence to the contrary. Now, to their credit, we should remember members of Congress reconvened that very evening. And I, you know, I, I remember the depth of the uncertainty that afternoon about what was gonna happen once, even once the police cleared the building um, and secured the area. Um, so it was, it was really to the credit of Congress that they reconvened that evening, confirmed the election results and moved on. But even so, more than 100 members of the House Republican Caucus, um, a majority of Republicans in the House and a bunch of senators um, refused to recognize the election results and this denial of the election uh, continues. So Suzanne Mettler, my co-author and I, um, sent our book, Four Threats, to the press in the spring of 2020. Um, we'd, after a year, a year and a little bit of furious writing, our publishers, as Joan said, were, were determined to get it out before the election um, in the vain hope that if Trump lost the election, this topic would no longer be relevant. Um, um, Sadly, it's good for book sales, but not maybe so good for the country. The book uh, continues to uh, 
um, have some, uh, some, some relevance. Over the next half year, between when we finished the book, um, leading up to the election, the damage to American democracy that we had begun to chronicle in the book only escalated. And so many events reminded us of occurrences in the American past that we had written about in the book. Um, and in particular, the insurrection on January 6th took us back to the late 19th century. In the decades, and I want to take you there now for a few minutes, in the decades following the Civil War, democracy, for those who had rights to participate, uh, was actually quite vibrant in the United States. It included not women yet, but African-American men in the South who had gained voting rights after the Civil War and were, in fact, for several decades after the Civil War, participating in elections at very high rates running for office primarily as Republicans. The Republican Party was the party of Abraham Lincoln, the party of emancipation. Um, and that was the home of most, most Black voters uh, in the South in the decades after the Civil War. At the same time, there was a new party that began to emerge in the United States, the People's Party, known as the Populists, um, out of the agrarian populist movement. Um, and it too began to run candidates uh, around the country very successfully. Um, but just as this flourishing of democracy was seemed to be underway in the South, um, uh, democracy was thrown quite suddenly and abruptly into crisis. I want to zoom into um, North Carolina in the 1890s. In no North Carolina in the 1890s, Republicans and populists discovered uh, that if they joined forces running candidates on what was called a fusion ballot or a fusionist ticket, they stood a chance of beating Democrats um, who were at that time in the South, the Democratic Party at the, in the South at that time was the party run by white elites. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so Republicans and populists were very successful throughout the 1890s. Um, in, in North Carolina as, as they were elsewhere. And in 1896, this fusion group of Republicans and populists managed to elect Republicans as governor and, um, and um, a majority of the state seats in the House of Representatives, the state assemblies, um, in the state assembly and the Democrats in, uh, the Republican the Democrats in North Carolina's worst fears had come to pass, right? They were losing power to this multiracial um, group of populists and Republicans. Um, in 1898, white Democrats in North Carolina staged what can only be described as a coup d'etat in the city of Wilmington. Wilmington at the time, Wilmington, North Carolina, in the eastern part of the state, was at, the, at that time the state's largest city, was quite a success story. Uh, African Americans were moving into the middle class. Three members of the city's board of aldermen were black, as were numerous public sector employees. The Daily Record uh, was a black owned newspaper, a very prominent, uh, well known black owned newspaper based in Wilmington, and one of the only daily black newspapers in the country. Democracy in North Carolina and Wilmington, particularly, seemed to be on the rise. But on the morning of November, and in, and in the 1898 election in early November, this fusion ticket of, of city government um, uh, was reelected successfully. Um, but on November 10th, 1898, nearly 2,000 white men who belonged to paramilitary groups gathered at the city's armory. They marched to the offices of the Daily Record. They set the building on fire and watched it burn. This is the Daily Record building after this event. They advanced through black neighborhoods um, and, and uh, rampaged through the city. Probably, we don't know exactly, but probably some uh, several hundred uh, people were killed um, over the course of the day. This band of um, violent militia members dragged prominent people from their homes, um, they rounded up a bunch of uh, city leaders, took them to the train station, forced them to resign and made them leave, ta leave town. Before the day was out, um, this group had at gunpoint forced the resignations of the mayor 
and the Board of Aldermen and installed their own city government in its place. Um, the, the similarities between this event in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898 and what happened or what almost happened in uh, Washington in, on January 6th of last year, those similarities I think were all too striking. Just like in 1898, we saw armed white supremacists as the most visible members of the of an insurrection. In both instances, it, this was not just a spontaneous mob of violent people. This was a group that was um, incited by political party leaders um, um, for their own political purposes based on the spread of misinformation. And what occurred in both events was that party leaders, leaders of one of the two major political parties, in one case in a state, but in the, in the other case uh, nationwide, were unwilling to abide by the most fundamental principle of democracy, that, when, that, that we hold elections, that someone wins and someone loses, and if you lose, you step aside, you accept the outcome, you tip your hat to the uh, winner, you concede, you communicate to your supporters that you do the same, and you vow not to let it happen again. You vow that you're going to work harder, you're going to um, you're going to compete again and try and win next time. That's not what happened in 1898. It's not what happened in 2020. Um, and the overarching question that we ask in the book uh, is: Should be we should we still be worried about this problem? Is the United States genuinely in peril um, today? Uh, some people say, eh, you know, things are uh, uh, unsettled, things are, are difficult, things are challenging, um, but we shouldn't worry that much. Right? Democracy has prevailed for a very long time. Um, we did in the end in 2020 have a, have a transfer of power, um, even if it wasn't exactly a peaceful one. Um, many people uh, uh, assume or, or observe that the United States is protected by a very old constitution that successfully guided democracy um, for more than 200 years, complete with its system of checks and balances, that's designed precisely to fragment power, to present a single individual or a single group from, from gaining too much power all at one time. Uh, the United States is wealthy. Uh, relative to other countries in the world, which is a factor that makes the loss of democracy less likely. Wealthier countries are less likely um, to lose democratic institutions. Um, and even though the democracy that the framers of the constitution designed and built included prominently anti-democratic institutions, particularly slavery, um, and it didn't really become a full democracy, I think, until the 1960s or 1970s. Democracy is more or less, these people might say, democracy is more or less progressed over time, becoming more robust, more inclusive over time. On the other hand, um, American democracy has often been at risk of deteriorating or what we call backsliding, moving backwards. As we've learned from those who study de democratic deterioration um, in other nations, we don't tend to see the end of democracy um, coming as a sort of classic coup d'etat. The sort of thing that happened in Wilmington that I just described in 1898 is not typically in the 21st century the way democracies end. Um, you know, canceled elections, the colonels marching into the presidential palace and abducting the president and taking over the radio station at the airport and declaring that they're in charge. Um, democracies tend to decline um, in the contemporary world in more subtle ways. Um, and eventually ending up with regimes where elections are still held, um, where many of the forms of democracy are observed. Um, but, uh, but still the things that make democracies work tend to decay. Um, so that countries become hybrid regimes containing some democratic features, but not others. Uh, political scientists call these regimes, uh, often call these regimes competitive authoritarian, competitive authoritarianism, think Turkey or Russia. These are countries hold elections and the, um, the, the, presidents of their country win the elections um, 
but there's no real competition. There's no real sense that that power is at stake in an election. Um, and democracy becomes a form that contains uh, a, a shell that contains a sort of authoritarian core. So what we've learned studying democracy and the deterioration of democratic regimes around the world is that we shouldn't think of democracy as sort of an on off switch. Democracy is a process. Democracy is a continuum. And the question is, are we moving forward? Are we moving backward? Are we moving toward a more full, robust, complete democracy? Or are we backsliding? Are we moving backward um, toward, uh, toward less of a democracy, toward greater authoritarianism? That's our task in the book. Um, and what we do in the book is to examine a series of earlier periods in the history of American democracy when people were legitimately concerned that we were moving in the wrong direction, that we were at risk of backsliding. So we, we look at these five earlier periods, um, we observe the patterns that ensued, um, and then we look at them, look at contemporary democracy, American democracy, in light of what we've learned about the way democracy has progressed or regressed in the past. Let me just say a word about what I mean by democracy, what we might mean to my, by democracy. Democracy is typically uh, thought of as a system of representative government um, with that's organized around um, mechanisms of accountability, but that makes the leaders accountable to the public typically through elections. Um, and uh, what we, we, we describe in the book, we describe what we call four pillars or four sort of indicators or measures of democracy that can tell us if democracy is robust and strong and moving forward, or if it's weak and moving backward. Uh, quickly, the four pillars are, um, first of all, free and fair elections. One political scientist, Adam, uh, Adam Jaworski, has defined democracy most simply as a system in which parties lose elections. In order for that to happen, elections have to be free and they have to be fair. Um, and the, to the extent that elections are free and fair, we can say we have a stronger or weaker democracy. A second, cat, uh, second pillar or indicator of strong democracy is the rule of law. The idea that law applies equally to everyone that, um, that, that, that the rules of society govern the way society operates, that people in power don't get to skirt the law or evade the law or, 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 or avoid being subject to the law. Um, third, and very important to the, to the way democracy functions is, as we'll see, is the idea of the legitimacy of the opposition. We have to, under, we have to believe if, if, uh, in order for democracy to work, that everyone gets a fair shake at participating, even and especially people that we disagree with, people who belong to other parties, um, and people who, if they took control of the government, would do things that we don't like. We need to understand that those people are legitimate opponents, um, and they have a right to participate, they have a right to compete for power, and even if they win, um, they still um, hold legitimacy. That's a very difficult idea. And that's something that's kind of come and gone throughout American history, as we'll see. And a fourth pillar of democracy, a thing that makes democracy work, is what we call the integrity of rights. The idea that we need to protect a set of rights that are necessary in order for these other things to work, particularly voting rights, um, civil rights, um, rights like free assembly, um, uh, the right to petition, um, the right of free expression um, and civil liberties. The, the idea that people are free to form and voice their own opinions and join together um, in order to try and influence others. So these four features of democracy give us a set of indicators that we can assess in the five periods and the present to see whether democracy is thriving, whether it's moving forward or moving backward. Um, and what we've learned um, from those who study democracy around the world is that four three key threats make democracy vulnerable. This is what gives rise to the title, excuse me, of the book. The first, um, and this is uh, should be familiar to anyone who's been paying attention um, at all for the last few years. Um, the first is, is political polarization. Democracy works especially well when there are 
when society consists of multiple groups, multiple identities, um, and people have what we might call overlapping or cross-cutting affiliations. That is to say, when people associate with other people who have different views, um, whether in your place of worship, your workplace, civic organizations, and so on and so forth. What's problematic, and, and what's pro so difference is not by itself a problem for democracy. What's problematic is when these differences increasingly align and when people sort themselves out into two camps, and especially when those two sort of competing groups, non-overlapping, non-cross-cutting groups, um, come to identify with different political identities, come with different political parties in particular, then politics becomes rather than a sort of um, uh, operation of uh, accommodation or compromise, it becomes a sort of game of us versus them. Um, it becomes less like uh, a sort of um, a, a process of negotiation and accommodation. It becomes more like mortal combat. And opponents, rather than being sort of legitimate antagonists, come to be seen as enemies, right? And the danger that pe people see a real danger if the other side were to take control of the government, right? Um, so, so that's one of the reasons, uh, or, or in a nutshell, the reason why polarization at a very high level is dangerous for democracy because it forces democracy to devolve into this sort of us versus them game. Second threat that's common to a lot of societies where democracy has deteriorated is what we call conflict over membership and status, conflict over the boundaries of the com political community. Again, democracy works well in a community where we agree generally about who's in and who's out, who's part of the society, um, what groups are in, what status they have, um, who gets to participate in this sort of mutual system of accountability. Um, rifts, disagreements about who is who has full status as a member of society can pose seriously problematic for democratic, uh, democratic politics. In particular, political scientists have noted around the world that unresolved rifts, especially form what, what, what some people call formative rifts, rifts that date to the founding of the country, um, rifts over who is included can reemerge again and again as a source of trouble. And in the United States, that has happened repeatedly, particularly over issues of race. Um, and in, this, in the periods that we examine, race perpet continually takes center stage, as in North Carolina in the 1890s, as a source of conflict over who's in, who's out, who has full membership and full status and full rights in the society. A third uh, source of threat to democracy is rising economic inequality. Um, places where economic inequality is high, and in particular where it's growing, are more likely to suffer democratic deterioration. Why is this? Many people think that it's because um, of the risk that the, the, the have-nots, the poor, will rise up and overthrow the, 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 the powerful. Typically, that's not the case. Typically, democracy um, uh, recedes in highly unequal places, not because the poor rise up, but because the rich band together. Um, the wealthy will become, will worry that um, the masses who typically outnumber them um, will, will uh, impose redistributive policies, higher taxes, increasing economic regulation, and those sorts of things. And to protect their interests, the wealthy in many um, highly unequal countries will seek to solidify their power in order to um, lock in their economic gains. And they will, they're willing to support repressive measures to do so, right? Maintaining economic inequality for wealthy people in society is often more important than preserving democracy, if that's what it takes. The fourth threat that we describe is what's called executive, what we call executive aggrandizement. 
Um, one of the things that I mentioned a little while ago about uh, the American Constitution is that it features what we call checks and balances. It spreads power out among different branches of government, between the executive branch and the legislature, between the federal government and the states. But um, uh, political scientists have noted that in countries where um, the chief executive, the president, the prime minister, um, the, a single leader, the top leader, is able to increasingly concentrate power in his or her own hands um, to the expense of checks and balances, um, that makes democracy, that puts democracy at risk. It makes the nation more prone to sort of tyrannical um, um, politics. Um, so uh, all four of these, um, uh, Oh, so I think I um, I missed a few slides here. So these slides that are just uh, describing what I just said about the four threats. So uh, um, I have a variety of different slide decks that I use for this. So I never quite remember which slide I'm on when. Um, so uh, all four have, of these threats, and this is one of one of the main findings of the book, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in, the, in a minute. All four of these threats have sort of waxed and waned, gone up and down. Um, and combined and recombined in different ways in American history. Um, American democracy, what we find has been fragile and been in crisis again and again. And each of the moments of crisis, as I'll show you in a few minutes, has, um, has uh, come with a, some combination of these threats. So I wanna, uh, um, I wanna describe for a minute um, uh, an episode in the history of American democracy. Um, so listen to this description for a minute. And think about what it evokes. Political polarization had been growing for years. Each action by one camp in the country provoked an even greater counterreaction from their opponents. The president signed into law provisions that made it more difficult for immigrants to attain citizenship, permitted the United States to deport immigrants who were deemed dangerous or who were from hostile nations, in addition, the president signed a different law that would allow for the prosecution of journalists who openly criticized his administration. Both of these uh, laws were efforts to weaken the political opposition. The year that I'm describing, this is a real uh, set of, uh, of events, the year that I'm describing was not 2017 or 2018 or 2020. This was 1798. The president was John Adams, and he just signed into law the Alien and Sedition Acts. Adams's party, or emergent political party, the Federalists, defended the act as essential for national security. The country was a their country was sitting sort of sitting on this dangerously on the sidelines of a war between France and England. Um, there was uncertainty in the country about which side, if either, we should take. Um, 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 the, the, the Jefferson and his Republicans were um, causing a lot of trouble um, and uh, Adams and his uh, cronies looked on Jefferson as quite dangerous. Um, and, uh, and so Adams, the Congress, the Federalist controlled Congress signed, passed and Adams signs the Alien and Sedition Acts, which allowed the president to, to basically to deport uh, um, non-American citizens who were deemed dangerous and to put people in jail for criticizing the government in public. Um, as one congressman, uh, Federalist Congressman put it, there was no need to, quote, invite hordes of wild Irishmen, nor the turbulent and disorderly of all the world to come here with a basic view to distract our tranquility, unquote. No sooner was the ink dry on the US Constitution, which we sort of revere as this fount of democratic governance, no sooner was the ink dry on the Constitution than Americans became deeply, deeply polarized. And as I just mentioned, public officials led the way. Um, the same leaders who had decried that what they called the, what, what James Madison called the mischiefs of faction. The Washington administration earlier had already um, had its own media outlet, the Gazette of the United States, which was a newspaper, a government sponsored newspaper that was dedicated to um, saying nice things about the government. 
um, Jefferson said, wait a minute, how come they get they have their own newspaper? Um, we're going to start our own newspaper, um, which they called the National Gazette, um, I think just to confuse people, um, to give voice to this emerging, his emerging opposition. Um, and this began a war of words. Um, um, James Madison and Jefferson wrote uh, anonymously for the Republican newspaper, lambasting the Federalists. Alexander Hamilton wrote his own sort of vitriolic responses, also anonymously defending the Federalists. Um, these were, and these were some, these were mean spirited, personal, challenging things. This was not sort of like polite, decorous New York Times op ed writing. This was, you know, this made sort of cable TV wars look like a well mannered garden party. Um, personal scurrilous attacks from behind the veil of anonymity um, didn't really matter whether these things were things they published were true or not. Um, um, this was nasty, nasty stuff. Uh, ordinary Americans too took sides. Federalists and Republicans often resided in different neighborhoods. They attended different churches. Uh, as hostilities grew, they uh, took on their own ways of demonstrating their patriotism. They burned public figures in effigy. Um, um, uh, polarization grew quickly. Um, um, uh, conflicts over public policy broke out into violence. The Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania in the late 1790s was essentially a tax revolt um, against a federally imposed um, uh, tax on, on distilled uh, liquor um, that was part of Hamilton's um, uh, financial plan. Um, um, it turned violent. And in fact, George Washington, when he was president, actually led troops on horseback, sword drawn, the whole deal um, um, uh, against, uh, um, uh, against tax re rebels in, in, during the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, by the time he got to where they thought they were, where he thought they were, they had fled into the woods. So there was never actually a battle, but it remains the only time a sitting US president has actually led uh, American troops into, uh, onto the, onto a battlefield. Um, this was, this was, this was challenging, violent, um, nasty conflict. Um, political leaders had not yet developed, uh, the idea of a legitimate opposition, right? The idea that people could, um, um, take different approaches to governing can compete with each other routinely through political processes and that an election would allow one party to replace the other party peacefully. Um, many Americans watch this growing division and work with the worry both that the other side would win and bad things would happen or that self-government might not survive the decade and in fact as the election of 1800 drew near, both sides had militias sort of mobilized, ready to move in if anything untoward happened. Um, it was just by the skin of our teeth that in the election of 1800, um, Jefferson was elected president, the Federalists um, stood down um, and, party, and power was transferred peacefully without a lot of bloodshed. Um, the point is, early American democracy was fragile. Um, and that was due really to only one of these threats, polarization. Um, in the 1850s, moving forward, and I won't say that much about this, but because uh, we mostly know this story, in the 1850s, the confluence of three threats, polarization, racial conflict, and rising economic inequality precipitated the Civil War. And these same, same three threats, um, polarization uh, returned in the 1890s. And I want to return again to the 1890s for just a minute. A few minutes after the Wilmington coup that I described a few minutes ago, um, the leaders of the North Carolina Democratic Party took measures statewide to make their power permanent. They scaled back voting rights by establishing poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, a host of familiar uh, legal maneuvers um, both in law and in state constitutions to disenfranchise black voters. Um, and they were quite upfront and open about this. One Democratic state senator uh, at this point, at, at this time, said that he favored, quote, a good, square, honest law that will always give us a good Democratic majority, close quote. Um, this was the leading edge of what became a major transformation that was occurring around the South. 
white elites in the South shut down the political opposition, shut down this um, uh, uh, fusion Republican populist uh, movement that was beginning to, um, that was competing successfully for power around the South. Um, and African-American voters were widely disenfranchised through the former Confederate states. The federal government, including uh, Republican presidents permitted this. In 1898, um, President William McKinley um, received requests from African-American leaders in Wilmington um, asking for help, but he were, failed to intervene. Um, and as disenfranchisement happens after state, in state after state, um, Theodore Roosevelt, the successor Republican president just simply watched and William Howard Taft, his successor, went so far as to praise these restrictive rules in the South for excluding what he called, quote, an ignorant, irresponsible element, unquote, from the electorate. By the end of the 1890s, millions of black men and some poor whites were disenfranchised and um, all four of the pillars of democracy that I've described before had suffered harm. Free and fair elections were no longer really held in the South. Um, the rule of law was gone. Um, the, the, the legitimacy of the opposition had been undermined and rights were, were, um, were, were undermined as well. Um, Jim Crow was established, it lasted for 60 years. This was a really severe uh, episode of democratic backsliding in the United States. Um, moreover, white Southern elites regained extra political power. Um, they had had extra power because of the three-fifths rule in the con original constitution that gave so white Southerners extra representation in the South. By disenfranchising Black people, but still counting them in the census, which, which was used to apportion uh, representatives in the House, white Southerners gained outsized political power in federal and national politics uh, for decades to come. Um, Democratic backsliding in the 1890s was hardly inevitable. Three threats to democracy that I've described, uh, polarization, rising economic inequality, and, and racial antagonism coalesced, coalesced and, and this is an important point, political leaders took advantage of them in ways that led to severe backsliding. This is not an automatic process when the threats are, that when the threats are present, backsliding happens. The threats provide opportunities for political for political leaders um, uh, to um, uh, 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 to pursue power. Um, that racism drove uh, democratic backsliding was plain to see. Southern Democrats sought to gain and hold power. They wanted to wrest it from Republicans and populists who had become increasingly competitive. To do that. They um, uh, embraced white supremacy, not just because they were white supremacists themselves, but because it worked incredibly well as a political strategy to unify whites, to widen political polarization, um, and to um, um, sanction uh, uh, removal from the electorate of members of the opposition, right? So, so polarization, and the, the, the overlap of polarization and racism and economic inequality becomes not just a set of conditions, it's a strategy that leaders were able to use in order to drive a wedge of the electorate. Um, so racism was undoubtedly the most um, uh, overt threat to democracy, but it didn't act alone. Um, this was also a period of extremely high polarization, very much like today, uh, between the parties, um, um, and Southern Democrats, as I said, stoked polarization to suit, to suit their purposes. This was also a period of extremely high and rising economic inequality. Um, um, but, that, but, the, but the role of economic inequality is easy to miss, uh, especially because um, of the, because of the very prominent role of race and the rise of Jim Crow in the South. Um, um, but it was instrumental nonetheless. A lot has changed. But we think that the politics of the 1890s reverberates today. Then as now, we, saw, we see a high degree of polarization. Um, we see rising economic inequality. We see pol political leaders um, using sort of race baiting rhetoric and tactics, including that directed against immigrants to fuel anger 
to promote political participation among white supporters, um, we, we see white supremacy and polarization animating politics and, a, and, and, and often obscuring the purposeful activities of economic elites to try and achieve their political goals. In sum, um, these historical episodes reveal that American democracy has uh, been more fragile than we might think. And this uh, chart here is a little summary of the book in that we it shows the five episodes, five historical episodes that we, we chronicle um, and uh, the presence or absence of the threat, the different threats in these, in these periods. Um, you can see they've sort of um, moved up and down and combined and recombined in different ways. Um, the 20th century was really the century of executive aggrandizement, the growth of the presidency, um, and we chronicle that through the rise of, of Franklin Roosevelt and Watergate in the 1970s. Um, um, but today we have what I think is really a, quite a dangerous convergence. This is the first time that we've seen all four threats at once. Um, and, uh, and I think that means we're in a very dangerous moment. What I want to do with, um, I've already talked longer than I meant to, but I want to just show you some little bit of, of, of data to um, describe how these threats have grown and have been sustained in the last couple of decades. And then I'll conclude and look forward to a uh, conversation. Um, so let me just talk first a little quickly about polarization. Um, so this is, these are two charts that show measures, uh, show a measure of um, essentially congressional ideology. This is a measure of how, how liberal or conservative members of Congress are. Um, the, the graph on the left shows um, the uh, difference between the average Democrat and the average Republican in the House and the Senate. So a low number means Republicans and Democrats are relatively close together. A high number means Democrats and Republicans are relatively far apart. Um, and you can see that over time, since the 1960s, um, um, the parties have grown much farther apart. On the right, you see this is the same data. It's just shown differently. This is the average, uh, the scores of the average Democrat and the average Republican. The scores themselves don't really mean anything um, in this scheme. Positive numbers are conservative, negative numbers are liberal. Um, and so you can see the average Democrat, the dotted line at the at, the, at the, uh, the, the solid line on the bottom, rather, the average Democrat has grown maybe a little bit more liberal um, over time. The average Republican, though, has grown a lot more conservative. Same results, though. The parties used to be relatively more close together. Now they're relatively farther apart. If this graph, one, one more thing about this graph, if this graph showed, some versions of this graph show little dots for each member of Congress. Um, uh, and if we're, that shows where each member, each individual is on this ideological scale. And what that would show if that, if those were on this graph, what that would show is that in the 60s and 70s, there were lots of dots in the middle, sort of in the, in between, in, around zero, right? There were lots, you know, even though on average, Democrats were pretty liberal and Republicans were pretty conservative. There are lots of people in the middle. There are some conservative-ish Democrats and some liberal-ish Republicans. Now they're two globs completely separated by a big white space, right? The most conservative Democrat is more liberal than the most liberal Republican in Congress, right? The parties are, are there's no overlap. Um, but this is not just true among members of Congress or among elites or elected officials. This is increasingly true of, of the public as well. Um, this graph shows uh, people's responses to what we call feeling thermometers. So you ask people um, how you know, cold or warm they feel towards something or some person on a scale of one to 100, where 100 is very warm. That's what you'd say about kids or your spouse, you know, most of the time, um, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and very cold is where you, what you'd say towards something or someone that you really don't like. Um, so what this shows is that over time, um, uh, people feel, was, um, so people, people, people are asked on this regular annual every other year survey, you know, how do you feel about your party and how do you feel about the other party? 
right? So people feel about their own, the dotted line is people feel pretty warmly about their own party and that hasn't changed very much over time. What has changed over time is the solid line on the bottom, which is ha how cold people feel toward the opposite party. People are increasingly motivated in politics, not, as, as, as not so much by affection or support for their own party, but by dislike for the other party, right? You know, I root for the Boston Red Sox, but I really hate the New York Yankees. Um, last time I gave this talk, I was in the UK. I had to use like Chelsea and Liverpool and I wasn't even sure I was getting it right, but, um, but you get the idea. Um, so this antagonism toward the other party, which what political scientists have come to call negative partisanship, is increasingly motivating voters, right? Um, I like my own party, but I'm really worried about what would happen to the country if the other party took over. Another way, uh, uh, this is partisanship, this kind of negative antagonistic partisanship has been increasingly infused and overlaps with racial antagonism. This is a measure over time of what political scientists call racial resentment, which is a standard way of measuring the extent to which people hold sort of racially prejudicial or stereotypic stereotype attitudes. Um, um, so high, high numbers on the scale um, are high levels of racial resentment, lower numbers are lower, lower levels of racial stereotype or, or prejudice. Um, and you can see that, um, again, the parties have diverged a great deal over time, right? The distance between the, the dotted line on the top, that's Republicans, um, and the dashed line on the bottom, that's Democrats, has grown, it, um, right? So increasingly, um, party, the parties, Americans are sorting themselves out into political parties by um, racial attitudes. Uh, um, whereas you can see in the 1980s and even into the 1990s, that wasn't true. The difference between the parties on racial attitudes was not that great. This is particularly an acute uh, difference um, in, the, in the years since the election of Barack Obama as president. That has really inflamed partisan antagonism over racial issues. Um, so you can see, uh, in addition to um, uh, uh, polarization growing, um, racial racial resentment has has grown and has sort of wormed its way into the party system. Um, racial this is uh, one picture of economic inequality. Um, there are lots of ways of measuring any economic inequality. This is one. This is the share of the share of total income that's earned by the top one percent of income earners. So add up all the income that people earn in the country. Then you line up people from, you know, Elon Musk at the top to the lowest earner at the bottom. You take the top 1% of earners, the 1% wealthiest income earners, and you calculate how much of the total income do those people get, right? Um, and you can see in the early 20th century, it was pretty un things were pretty unequal. In the middle of the 20th century, from about the New Deal in World War II through the 1970s or 1980s, um, um, the share of income that the wealthiest people got was much lower. Um, the, the income distribution and the wealth distribution were much flatter, but inequality has grown, gone up steadily and significantly to the point where we're now as unequal as we were at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, I don't have measures of executive aggrandizement, but take my word for it. Um, um, the growth of the president, the pre power of the presidency has grown. And when that becomes fused with partisan antagonism and polarization, um, uh, 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 that can be extremely dangerous. When presidents sitting on, on top of extreme, an extremely powerful office are tempted to use the power of the presidency, not just to promote a policy pro uh, program, but to reward their friends and punish their enemies, um, um, that becomes extremely dangerous. That's what Richard Dixon tried to do during Watergate. Um, he was sort of slapped down at a period of relatively low polarization, um, um, but that becomes an increasingly dangerous problem. Um, and these threats have taken on a life of their own. And we think, what, Suzanne and I worry that they're really on course to persist for years. This is not a Trump problem. This is a problem that predated Trump. 
it's uh, it's still they, they still exist. The threats still exist now that um, Trump is gone, at least from the Oval Office, if not from the political scene. Um, as I mentioned before, the political scientist, and this is the last couple of things I'll say, um, the political scientist Adam Jaworski defines democracy as a system in which parties lose elections. This definition has a couple of implications for well-functioning democracy. First, it means that what we should expect parties to do is to compete for votes by trying to espouse popular positions um, and by pursuing policies that they think will benefit a lot of citizens, so people vote for them. Um, and second, it means that democracy succeeds when we agree in advance on what the rules are and we agree to follow the rules and abide by the outcome no matter who wins. Um, the winners at any given moment know that they'll be subject to the voter scrutiny again in the future, and that should prevent them from doing anything too outlandish or crazy. The losers know that they'll live to fight another day. But today, in the context of all four of these threats, we face what seems to be a kind of alarming situation where these conditions don't seem to hold. Um, as we speak, um, governing institutions are threatening to roll back long established rights, voting rights, women's rights. Um, and this is particularly in a, in a particularly acute problem, less at the national level, although it's happening at the national level too, but in states where um, particularly the Republican Party has gained power over both the, both the governorship and the state legislature, Wisconsin, North Carolina. Um, uh, Wisconsin, the, Republic, the Democrats have taken back the governorship, but, um, but places where Republicans are in charge, um, um, rights and the pillars of democracy seem to be under threat. Rather than pursuing moderate and broadly popular policies, that party is becoming increasingly shrill and extreme in the positions it takes on a wide range of issues. Um, that party has shown its willingness to go to any lengths to cling to power, regardless of what the voters say. Um, for years, decades, I thought it was my job as a political science professor teaching students about American government to try really hard um, not to, to be not done, not to be partisan, not to make claims about, you know, which party I prefer, or which party is better. Um, I think the gloves are off, though. I think there's one of the challenges that we're facing is that we've got a party that doesn't seem willing or eager or able to abide by the rules of democracy. Um, and that puts us in a very dangerous, I think, uh, position. Um, whether democracy can be saved depends not just on these conditions that I've described, not just on the threats, but on the choices that political leaders and citizens make, even under these conditions. Um, American history has been full of such choices. And in some instances, people have chosen a destructive path as in the 1980s. Um, in others, they found a productive way forward um, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the New Deal, the post Watergate reforms, for example. Um, if history is any guide, we can't take democracy for granted. Um, and I think restoring it needs to be a very high priority, which is why I'm so uh, happy to be here sharing some of these thoughts with you and to hear about your the initiative that you all are undertaking. So I'm sorry I went on much longer than I expected to, um, but I'm happy to uh, uh, take questions. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lieberman. And now, um, yeah, let's do a little, there's also Jamie's got his uh, hand. Uh, Jamie, is that a question or is that a clap? It's That's a, a question. It's a right? question, I'll wait. Okay, I'll wait. so Jamie, uh, I'll just say, if you don't mind, uh, that he is not only co-president of our congregation, but an American historian by okay. training and profession. So go ahead. Oh, so I'm in trouble is what you're saying. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. I, I'm with you. Uh, as you say, the gloves are off. Uh, after 20 years of trying to be as nonpartisan as possible, it, it, it becomes increasingly difficult. But um, in the interest of talking about how to restore democracy, thinking about the four factors, um, three of which seem to really be mutually reinforcing the polarization, conflict over membership and economic inequality in particular. Um, but I'd like to focus on the polarization and ask if you uh, 
if there are episodes in American recent history and or other countries that point to how we can work to abate that polarization that is such a, a corrosive force in our democracy. And it seems to me that crises, existential crises like the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, and even for a short time, environmental issues and the, you know, the coming together in the 1980s, there was a bipartisan approach to global you know, climate change. Um, but crises like the 2008 uh, economic crisis, the pandemic, have only gotten sucked into a process of further polarization. And I'm hopeful that in this, this is this comes off as perverse even saying it, but uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there are some glimmers of that being a shock to the United States and to the international system, that liberalism is reviving from you know, the, 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 uh, the sleep that polarization and economic inequality and, and so on have brought to it. But I'm just wondering if you have any, episode, any insights from the past that suggest what can be done to reverse this, this increase in polarization. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a that's that is that's probably the toughest question to ask of this whole uh, problem. I mean, the 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 problem is that we discovered in American history is that the way these crises have often been resolved and the way polarization has sort of been brought to heel um, usually involves taking rights away from someone. Right. The 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 it's, these that happens usually at the expense of African-Americans, right? That's, that's sort of how the crisis of democracy in the 1890s, early 20th century was resolved, right? By disenfranchising um, black Americans, right? Um, uh, and, and you get a period in the 20th century when polarization by the, the way we measure it, the way we sort of think about um, um, the way it operates in American politics was relatively low, the parties you know, competed, um, but uh, but they um, uh, but they did so sort of by agreeing to take the issue of black rights for black Americans off the table. Right? So the, the the real challenge is how to reduce polarization um, without taking that issue of racial equality off the agenda and create a real kind of multiracial democracy. Um, I'm, I'm sort of really not answering your question. I'm just restating it, making it even harder. Um, and I think, and that, that to me, that's one of the most dangerous things about the current situation that's most reminiscent to the 1890s is a sort of fusion of polarization and racial antagonism. Um, that's a sort of long-winded non-answer. Um, the crisis question is also a really interesting one. Um, and you're right that, that, you know, certainly in the 20th century, these sort of recurring major world historical crises, the Depression, you mentioned the World War II, the Cold War, um, created a sense of common purpose. Um, and in many, and often in a way sort of spurred the United States toward the civil rights revolution in the late 20th century. Um, it's not clear to me even that crisis works the same way in American politics as it used to. I mean, what's the biggest, the biggest crisis we've faced in the last few decades is the COVID pandemic. Um, and look at the reaction to COVID was is entirely framed by people's partisanship, right? Um, everything that happened in the, in, the, in, in the response to the pandemic was colored by partisanship, mask mandates, vaccinations, school opening and closing, and all of these things that happened um, um, made partisanship and partisan antagonism worse, if anything. Um, now, maybe, I, you know, I think you're right about the Ukraine uh, invasion. It's not, at least as a matter of global politics, there seems to be a sort of revival of the idea of the liberal alliance. Um, among democratic countries. Um, it's not clear that that's um, 
not clear what kind of leverage that's going to give us in the United in American politics. I wish I had something happier to report. No, I I, I agree with all you say, and I I wish I had something happier to yeah. report. Too. <laughs> Thanks so much. Joyce, go ahead and yeah, great. Yeah. Th thank you. Um, very quickly, there are movements afoot in the U.S. around reducing polarization, places like uh, organizations like Braver Angels and so on. That, and I, I might like to uh, hear your thoughts about that. But I have a, I have a more pressing thought that I wanted to yeah. uh, introduce, and that is like as just as you have uh, tried to be nonpartisan, I have tried to not put anti-Semitism and Jewish fear at the center of my, um, you know, thinking and feeling about American democracy. And yet it feels as if it is, uh, it is to coming to the fore, coming uh, more central uh, at the same time that it is inv uh, invisible in many places, right? In, in, it's invisible in plain sight. So what from history uh, would you, uh, what, what wisdom or uh, what thoughts do you have about the, the role of anti-Semitism and how it compares with where it is in the current uh, attack on democracy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't really have an answer to that because it's not something that I, I, I have a lot of, um, I, don't, I don't have a really good historical picture of anti, the sort of rise and fall of anti-Semitism against these threats as, as part of as part of this pattern of threats. Um, so I don't really have a good historical answer for that question, although it's certainly something we're thinking about. Um, uh, you know, it, it is, it is, I agree, it's really striking um, the extent to which um, you know, anti-Semitic rhetoric and the sort of um, you know, the mingling of Nazi white supremacist symbolism and, and, um, and rhetoric has, be, has crept into or blush, you know, not crept, but sort of blasted into these anti-democratic movements that are at the, we, you, that we used to think were sort of at the fringe of society, but now become, seem to be becoming part of this anti-democratic movement. Um, I, I think that's something, so someone needs to think about that systematically. Um, I would also, I, you know, this is not, but this is not just an American issue either. I mean, anti-Semitic um, incidents in European countries um, have been going up as well in the UK and France. Um, you know, it's becoming dangerous to be a Jew in, in, in the Western world. Um, in a way that it hasn't been, you know, certainly for most of my lifetime. Um, I think, you know, I think in general, people who um, people who grew up in the United States in the middle to late twentieth century um, tend to not tend, we we tend to not realize that we grew up and came to sort of political maturity in a relatively placid, relatively mm -hmm. calm, placid, um, stable time. Mm -hmm. um, and we tend to think that's normal and this is abnormal. Mm -hmm. What I think a longer view of history looks like, looks like is what, whatever this is we're going through is more normal than we'd like to think. I think Jews have a particular understanding of that history because that's sort of, you know, we've been living that for 4,000, 5,000 years. Um, and I think even in the period when many Americans thought that a, a democracy was very stable, there's a sort of ironic worldview and looking over our shoulder at all kinds of horrible things that have happened to us and our people and our families for a long time that have made us natural skeptics of that view. But even so, um, I agree, it's quite alarming. If there other, isn't a, other another, I, I, if I could just respond, if there if there isn't another question, yeah, go ahead. Conversation, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, with it, well, uh, with a group of folks who were uh, thoughtful people thinking about what's going on in uh, in our country, 
uh, and most of whom were, were Gentiles, uh, I posed the, the challenge to them of actually themselves looking for anti-Semitism, noticing that anti-Semitism doesn't get mentioned or looking at, you know, when if there's something going on, whether it was what happened in Buffalo, uh, what happened in, you know, that there, it, it mm -hmm. didn't get, it doesn't get talked about, even Charlottesville. It was sort of, by the way, it was racism was talked about, but not the element of anti-Semitism that was there. So I've encouraged folks actually as allies to Jews to look for anti to look for and name anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And what response do you get when you Oh, um, they were they were well, there are people who I have, you know, loving relationships with. They were they were, you yeah. know. They were it's, on board. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, but it's, I think it's, most it's, often people, unless they've been really uh, carefully cultivated as allies, mm -hmm. uh, people with very good folks with good intentions don't get the the uh, yeah. the anti-Semitism. Yeah. No, that's a that's a really good point. Sandy, did you have a question? Your hand. Waving your hand. Yeah, that was that was yeah. the old-fashioned hand wave. Thank you for catching <laughs> Great. Great. Um, Well, you know, I really appreciate Joyce, you're bringing this up too, because I mean, we certainly are aware that political maneuvering has fanned the flames of both racism and anti-Semitism, and uh, I think that uh, that. Professor Lieberman has given us some perspective too about how at least racism has been fanned by political maneuvering. Um, and so it, I think it makes uh, good sense to take a closer look at how anti-Semitism over time has operated in a similar manner. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, different coalitions that have been developed, whether it's the Poor People's Campaign that has attempted to pull together rural poor and um, disenfranchised people of color. Uh, and then there's, you know, Listen Up is just, it has all of, it's a, all of these different organizations under their sort of umbrella that have had as their mission to bridge differences and to reduce political polarization. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are, Professor Lieberman, about how to um, build on that, uh, how to um, help that to become more influential, more widespread, um, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, I, and I think it is it is impressive um, <clears throat> how how much of that there's been in the last few years. Um, um, you know, not just the sort of the kinds of political organizing that you were describing, but um, even the the um, sort of up Black Lives Matter upsurge of 2020 after the George Floyd murder. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Uh, suggests that you know there people are people are there are a lot of people in the country who are frustrated by this, um, and I found the the Black Lives Matter that sort of summer Black Lives of Black Lives Matter at the beginning of the pandemic particularly impressive because this was not just the sort of usual suspects out protesting. This was, um, you know, uh, white people and black people and Latinos together, and not just in big cities, suburbs and rural communities. There was, a, it was really interesting. Um, I think it's kind of dissipated and that particular uh, movement hasn't, didn't really have the kind of traction that a lot of us had hoped. But I think there's a, there's a sense that people, that there is a, there is a potential coalition of people um, who are who want to do something different? I think the the challenge is the country is very closely divided, right? Um, um, elections are uh, elections are extreme, national elections at least are extremely close, um, and one of the challenges is we're governed at the moment by a bunch of non-majoritarian institutions, right? The United States Senate. 
um, which over represents rural places, um, the Supreme Court, um, um, which isn't subject to the sort of rules of democratic accountability as we are seeing right now. I'm sure in the next week or so, we'll get the final readout on what they've done, what they're doing to us this year. Um, 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 and presidential elections, right? You know, we've had now two out of the last six presidential elections where the person who won the most votes didn't get elected president because the rules dictate otherwise. Um, so there's a there's a there's a real um, um, sort of institutional hurdle for that kind of coalition building. Um, on the on the maybe maybe more encouraging side. Um, you know, we've seen uh, increasingly um, courts striking down partisan gerrymanders, these attempts to draw congressional districts or state legislative districts um, to get rid of competitive elections. That's the main goal of gerrymanders. Um, so that democracy becomes actually a real competition between parties and not just a sort of dividing up of the country into mine and yours, right? That's the kind of thing um, that I think can be productive, right? The sort of kind of movements, not just to for people to get along with each other at a personal level, right? But to think about what it means to live, to have democratic institutions and what it means for a functioning democracy to actually govern the country, right? And how do we produce some kind of, you know, real competition, um, according to the rules, as I said, rules that we agree on so that win or lose, we can all move on um, and compete again next time, right? That's what I think is at risk. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, and that's what I think to the extent that organizing is gonna be successful, that's where it's gonna have impact. Great, Anne, is that your question or Jamie's? Yeah. It is. Yes. Yes. Hi, thank you. Hi. Thank you, Robert. Um, really, really great presentation. Um, I think another recent crisis that perhaps brought people together across the divide a little bit and reduced that polarization was the public's response to Hurricane Maria and the devastation in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Briefly, right? And then I think as Trump intervened, and people were either supporting or criticizing his intervention, then we saw the polarization reemerge. But it was a moment where a lot of Americans came to understand more about Puerto Rico. Um, and so I wanted to mention two things in relationship to that. This is what I study, I'm another historian, sorry. Um, so in the 1890s, right, you were talking about events in North Carolina, but of course this is also the moment when the US is really building formal empire in a big way, um, which of course compromises um, representative democracy and, and still does as Puerto Rico is still a colony. And then the, the current event piece is that there is now a bill before the House, a compromise bill between um, Hispanic uh, legislators who support statehood and those who support all options, including independence. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to see if the kind of off the rails Republican Party opposes um, allowing a binding legislation, a uh, binding referendum in Puerto Rico that would mandate that Congress implement the results of that. Because to refuse to do that would be to, again, um, really limit democracy in that sense and not allow American citizens in Puerto Rico to determine their own fate in an ultimate sense. And to really go back to the 1890s when Congress, you know, by this was given control over the colonies by the Supreme Court. Um, so I think thinking about those kinds of issues of empire and colonial citizens would be a good thing to add to the whole mix of analyzing what's going on. Thanks. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, I, I, um, I don't want to make this into a, uh, too much of an academic talk, but I will say um, I have a graduate student who's just finishing a dissertation on this very topic. So look for a book in, a, in the next couple of years. May Henning is her name. It's awesome. Um, um, no, that's a really important point. I mean, um, but but that but but you hit on the the conundrum that I was just mentioning, which is that we have rules that that empower people who want to um, preserve their own power, right? Um, and statehood, you know, the sort of state the statehood idea is not a big <laughs> thing, 
why do we have why do we have two Dakotas? Why is there a North and South Dakota? If you look at maps of the United States in the 1870s, there was one big blob of territory up there called the Dakota Territory. It's like a square, right? But then all of a sudden, by 1890, whatever, there are North Dakota and South Dakota. Why? Because the Republicans in the, who controlled Congress at the time knew that if they made it into two states Senator. instead of one state, they'd get four Republican senators instead of two, right? So the rules empower ambitious politicians, especially at moments of high polarization, to use to use their power to embed themselves and to give to give themselves future power. Right. That's the problem. That's the challenge. And that's the real that's to me is the real polarization problem. Right. The, it's not the, it's the real polarization problem is not that we so much that we disagree with each other a lot, you know, maybe more than we used to. The real problem is that it provides an incentive for people to use the use the rules to embed themselves in power. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the sort of you know most noxious example of this is the whole the Mitch McConnell um, 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 uh, Merrick Garland thing in the last year of the Obama presidency. Right. Nothing he did was against the rules. Um, but it was pretty lousy, right? It was it was not in the spirit of, you know, honoring the results of elections. Um, so uh, so that's the conundrum, and and you know I think you you know you bring up a really interesting um, set of possibilities, but it's hard to you know, um, but all of the incentives right now point to, you know, driving driving the rules as hard as you can for your own advantage. So I'm going to, we're getting close to the end of our time and I'm going to interject another yeah. um, sort of monkey wrench, <laughs> I guess, into the conversation um, myself. And, and, and that is um, that you've sketched uh, sort of what, what, ideal, what ideal democracy would look like. And yet, I guess my question is, is it always worth preserving? That, which is to say that in your book, for example, you talk about the crisis over the extension of slavery in the 1850s, which eventuated in the Civil War. There was no compromise possible, it seems to me, in that case. What would the compromise look like? Um, similarly, in the Roosevelt administration, uh, that's where you locate uh, the executive aggrandizement that then grows even more after the 1930s. But it had and it was a little bit different, right? Because there were certain things, as you point out, that the New Deal did with Congress's backing, but then there were other things that Roosevelt himself or his advisors did without um, congressional support, like the bank holiday at the very beginning of the <clears throat> Roosevelt administration. So, but it helped people. And and my my, um, problem today, and m my colleagues and friends on this call are not going to be surprised at what I'm about to say, is, is that I have trouble making um, both sides sort of moral equivalents. I mean, it's like Trump saying there were good people on both sides. I don't <laughs> think so, right? And, and so how do we, how, and I am not saying democracy is not worth preserving because it absolutely is, but how do we find a way to do that without um, creating the kind of compromise or, um, or middle ground that would actually uh, set us back in other ways? Yeah, that's an that's a, that's a important question. Um, yeah, so Winston Churchill, of course, said about democracy, it's the worst form of government ever devised by the mind of man, except for all the others, right? Um, 
And I mean, and, and it, you know, and as I've said, it's a, a feature of democracy that sometimes you lose and people who you would prefer not to have power get power, right? Um, and the question is at what, where's the line beyond which that becomes problematic, right? For the, for the very idea of democracy itself. Um, I, I mean, let me reframe the question in a, in a slightly different way. And that is, um, this is actually a big debate among sort of democracy advocates right now. And that is when, when one side plays um, what's what we call constitutional hardball, what do you do in response, right? Constitutional hardball is the idea of sort of using the rules within the, within the letter of the rules in ways that are not consistent with the spirit of democratic governance. And the, and, you know, the, 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 not you know refusing to have hearings for Merrick Garland when he's a legitimately legally nominated to the Supreme Court is a sort of example of that, right? Again, it's within the rules, but not in the spirit of democratic governance. So when you have a party that is willing across the board, un almost uniformly, um, to play constitutional hardball on behalf of um, a sort of anti-democratic stance, what's the right thing to do in response? Should the Democrats play hardball back, right? When they have the opportunity. Democrats are not generally very good at hardball. Um, it requires a level of organization and commitment and resolve that historically, at least in the last century or so, Democrats have not usually been able to muster. Will Rogers, the humorist, once said, I don't belong to an organized political party. I'm a Democrat. Um, um, so, but that's the question is, you know, to what level should, <clears throat> should Democrats be willing when, they're, when they have the option to play hardball, to do things that might be, if you really looked at it in the hard, cold light of day, a little bit ethically shady um, in order to, prevent a, you know, something worse. Um, that, and, you know, I think the civil war that you mentioned is a good example of that, right? Um, um, you know, in the end, the civil war was a, a matter of the, the South realizing that it wasn't gonna get what it wanted, which was the pres preservation of enslavement um, by adhering to democratic rules. So it just, it just you know, took, they said, we're taking our ball and going home um, and left the North really very little choice. Um, but even in a less extreme kind of situation, right? What's the right response to hardball? Um, you know, uh, and in, uh, again, I'm sort of restating the question without answering it, but I think that's what, that's what we have to think about is, right? What are the sort of, you know, are there things that we should be willing to resort to, um, you know, if push comes to shove, should we, you know, should we be playing playing with rules. Um, should Democrat, you know, Democrats have tried, Democrats are getting better at gerrymandering too, although they keep getting slapped down by the courts, both in your state and mine. Um, courts uh, undid de Democratic gerrymanders, that kind of thing. Um, 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 but that's the question to me is should the Dem should Democrats play hardball? Right. Well, we're John, writing John yeah. Richman has a question. Yeah, I, I just have a comment, and that is okay. That okay, Alan. One of, one of the things that seems that's different now than in all these past crises is that we have the internet and multiple media sites, which allow people to uh, reinforce each other in their beliefs and watch the kinds of me news media that they prefer which just reinforces their feelings and opinion. And, you know, when we, before we had Walter Cronkite, you know, and he, everyone would watch CBS News and, you know, it was the same for everybody, but that's not the case anymore. And so I don't know how we get past this, um, but it just, the internet and the multiple media stations, news stations yeah. have now create, have reinforced these divisions. Yeah. So, um, that's a really important observation. Um, a couple of things. First of all, the, the phenomenon of sort of separate media channels for separate groups of people is not a new phenomenon. 
We see that repeatedly in American history. I mentioned it in the 1790s, right? The Federalists had their newspaper and the Republicans had their newspaper. It's different it happened, now. I'm sorry. It happened, it, happened in the 18, it happened in the 1850s. The period that you're describing, again, the sort of middle, late 20th century, when there was this ideal of sort of New York Times, CBS, Walter Cronkite journalism um, that's universal and fact-based, that's unusual in American history. Most American history, in most American history, the media looked more like it does now than it did when you know you and I were younger. Um, what's different? So, so the so the idea that there are sort of separate information channels for separate groups of people is not a new thing. Um, um, what I think is different about the uh, social media, in particular is the algorithms, right? The idea that if you that, that if you click on something, they will feed you more of what you crave, like a, you know, rat in an experiment, um, you know, going to the, you know, you know, clicking, pushing the button and getting a hit of cocaine, right? Um, those are calculated not to produce information, but to produce clicks, to sell you, to sell ads, Right, and what sells ads, getting people all riled up in controversy, right? That's the, the problem I think with social media is the algorithms. It's not so much, I mean, the separate news, separate media channels is not great, um, but it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the social media piece of this that fuels misinformation in particular. I, I would just add that it's so much more widespread now, I mean, you know, in the past, there were different newspapers, how many people would get the newspapers or read the newspapers or, you know, follow that. You know, I understand that. But, you know, the media, Internet's in everyone's home now. And, and the, you know, the stations is in everybody's home. Yeah, no, it's, so it's, it's a little yeah. bit more widespread and universal now than it used to be. And I think that makes somewhat of a difference. I, I, I don't want to. Yeah, no, you're no, it's, 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 it's clearly an important factor. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to use uh, that question uh, to say one more thing, and then to uh, uh, thank Professor Lieberman and to make a couple of announcements. So the, the one more thing is, is also um, what I am not sure about, which is whether um, lying in <laughs> is lying and disbelief in evidence and disrespect for what there many of us used to share as an idea of truth whether that has is is different now or whether we've always had lying and disrespect for evidence of truth and i i, I actually even though i'm an american historian i really don't know the answer to that i i what what came to mind and was um how in the vietnam era people said, you know what we should do? We should just say, we won and leave. And that would be the end of the Vietnam War. And, you know, of course we didn't actually do that, but that was a, 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 the instance of a possible, possibly productive lie that came to mind. Right. I don't know about, about this uh, question. Um, Robert, maybe you can say one word. I don't want to keep you yeah. all night. You well, first of all, I mean, the Vietnam, the, we now know the Vietnam War was a war based on a huge stack of lies. So, right. um, and, and the Vietnam War did an enormous amount to undermine faith in both in government and in sort of the authoritative mm -hmm. institutions that we used to look up to um, for exactly that reason. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I think, I think, um, I think the lack of trust in both in institutions and in sort of science, facts, knowledge, that's a serious mm -hmm. issue. But even right. that has become a partisan football, right? Republicans are much more likely to distrust scientific findings, to right. distrust universities and so on and so forth than Democrats. So even that has sort of been sucked into the maw of partisan polarization. Right. And my 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 segue now, um, using the idea of lying, is to is just quickly to point out um, <laughs> what Joyce Herman has has written to me privately in the chat about the planned program in Rochester in August 
featuring Michael Flynn and Roger Stone uh, oh, and their, yeah, which is, which is now a local issue. It raises um, the question of anti-Semitism and racism and violence and all of the things we've talked about this evening. And um, I think um, we'll, um, so the Social Action Committee maybe could, could distribute more widely the ways that people are trying to respond to this locally. Um, the other thing, uh, um, Joyce, take 30 seconds to talk about what we are going to do in the fall, and then we are going to let our guests go. You're muted, though, Joyce. Well, thanks. Thank you, Joan. Thanks to Sandy for the suggestion of this, of, of having uh, uh, Professor Lieberman here. And thank you so much, Professor Lieberman. Um, this has been the uh, third, fourth in uh, third. So third in our series of uh, uh, responding to threats to democracy. And our thought was that the fourth, for the fourth one, we would go to a local level. And uh, Jennifer Leonard, who is the, uh, the outgoing uh, CEO of the Rochester Area Community Foundation, uh, and Simeon Bannister, who is the incoming uh, CEO of that organization, it is, it, they, they're, um, they manage all of the major foundation uh, and it's a central uh, place for foundation support. And they've been examining and uh, the inequalities in Rochester, uh, speaking of one of the threats, the huge inequalities, economic inequalities in Rochester based on race, uh, but not exclusively. Uh, so they will be speaking in September um, and uh, I, by then we hopefully will have, maybe we'll manage not to have that program, the, uh, the Roger Stone and Michael Flynn program come, but there will certainly be lots of, of, of uh, other ramifications from that, but that will, should be an exciting program as well. So please join us. Thank you. Okay, everyone, let's thank Robert Lieberman. You can clap, you can unmute and clap. It's been so, great to have this um, incredibly rich presentation and conversation. We have so much to think about and we appreciate it very much. Thank you Thank very much you. for having me. Right. Thank you. Thank Good night you. to all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Quick questions.